know, they ask for it and you send something in and then you don't even remember what the title is. But, yeah. Basically, I'm going to talk about HIV-1 envelope glycoprotein. So, uh, and for HIV vaccine, is probably mo we need a vaccine, but it, we're really at uh, a pretty, a relatively preclinical pre stage, at least to, in terms of eliciting broadly neutralizing antibodies, which is going to be the major focus of my talk, or at least how we envision making the proper antigens that will elicit such antibodies. So um, I was the first of the HIV people. I thought I'd put a little intro slides. I mean, many of you probably know this number, but this is the, the latest estimate by WHO, about 35 million infected people um, worldwide. Um, so I think that number alone uh, argues for uh, the need for a vaccine, which we don't have. And I guess you don't have to convince anybody here that we need a vaccine for, for almost any pathogen. Um, so what I'm focusing on is uh, this little envelope glycoprotein. So this is a, a schematic of a cryo-EM uh, micrograph of, uh, uh, that comes from this review of Gary Nabel and Dan Baruch. So HIV uh, is an envelope glycoprotein, and the protein on the surface, glycoprotein, is actually very uh, sparse. There's only about 10 to 12 per spike, which is a bit unusual for a lot of viruses. The virus presumably sacrifices stability for other immune evasion um, events. And this is the blow-up of the spike here. This is actually a cryo-EM uh, density that's been colorized. And there's a lot of features on here, but it, basically, just to say there's a trimer of GP120 above this line and GP41 below. I, for the purposes of this talk, we don't really need to go into details. And I guess one thing to focus on is there's a CD4 binding site on GP120, each of the three monomers that binds to the primary receptor, G CD4. And there's also a co-receptor binding site. But this is an attractive target because we make a lot of antibodies against this um, site. So the hypothesis we're really testing, at least at Scripps and, and in other areas, is that we need to generate broadly neutralizing antibodies for an HIV vaccine. Problem is, it's a highly variable virus. Most of the, um, I did just kind of skip by it, most of the variable loops up here are different, both in sequence and glycan, and link glycan array. So we try to focus on things like the conserved CD4 binding site. Um, the, the reason antibodies are uh, of interest, of course, is by numerous passive protection studies and the best model that we have, which is non-human primates challenged with SHIV, uh, which is a chimeric virus is between SIV and HIV, um, protect. They're completely sufficient as long as you have enough antibody. And uh, we're trying to re-elicit these with soluble envelope glycoprotein trimers. None of the antibodies that are protective come from vaccination. They all come from infected people in which they're isolated from the memory B cell compartment. This is a list of some of those that have uh, been uh, discovered recently. There's been a lot of high profile papers on these. Um, there's many against the CD4 binding site. There's some against the N-link glycans. They're shown here in blue. Again, this is the density of the envelope. There's several that bind up on sort of on the top of the spike here where the three protomers meet, and they're considered trimer specific because they require the quaternary packing of the spike to bind. So they're useful for soluble trimer design, which is where I'm going to get to. We're trying to make a soluble version of this to realistic antibodies. Another problem, there's a lot of host glycans. There's several antibodies down to GP41. There's a couple that have been recently reported here. Um, for the purposes of this, you don't really I don't think need those details. So just to show you a major problem, a major impediment are all these N-link glycans. So this is the density with the, the core that's been crystallized in the center here. So just one little spike. And then this is the core with all the glycans just on the core. Hopefully this will play. This was done by Bill Sheaf, it's just showing dynamic modeling of the glycans. And this is one antibody, B12, that binds to that yellow CD4 binding site. So you see there's not much room to get in there, um, w which is a major problem for most antibodies. Uh, what we've used in the past are soluble versions of this trimer, pieces of it, and they just can't get in with this uh, rather, rather limited access. And just to emphasize, again, if you put all the glycans, this is modeled. We actually have a, a higher resolution structure now, but you can see in blue, there's very little free polypeptide surface. So as a consequence, a lot of these broad, new broadly neutralizing antibodies, we call them BNABs, actually recognize polypeptide in part and glycan, which is self. So that's a problem, major problem for re -elicitation. I'm going to talk about um, co 
covalently linked soluble GP140 trimers, so the idea is to lift it off the virus. Presentev is an immunogen. It's not so easy. Um, there are others uh, called SOSIPs, of which there was a high-resolution structure from Ian Wilson's lab and an EM one from Andrew Ward's lab in science of this year, which really has changed the game in terms of being able to use the trimers for uh, design. So what I'm going to describe is very preclinical. Pre We've made a, um, a native flexible link trimer. Um, basically, this is GP120 just shown as a bar schematic. We put in different flexible linkers between it and GP41 and tried to make a spike that resembled what we see by cryo-EM uh, or, or cryotomography on the virus. There's one other change in GP41, but I won't go into that. So basically, we make these proteins, the lab grade at least, just in transient transfections, and then we do lectin affinity or size exclusion chromatography. I'm just going to show you from the crude supernatants how we screen for um, trimers that we like. So this is just an SDS gel, but we use these trim. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Sorry. Uh, we use SDS gels just to screen different variants of these, and these are the trimer-specific antibodies boxed in red. And you can see when we get the linker length right, you get a nice band from these trimers. If it's too short or too long, we don't get as intense a band. Uh, that is, um, again, just out of the crude supernatant. So that just gives an indicator that we're making well-ordered trimers because these antibodies highlighted in red will only bind to well-ordered trimers. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a couple of slides. So, but that slide also, uh, I skipped by it, there's some non-neutralizing antibodies that bind, so we, we realize there's a mixture of well-ordered and disordered trimers, because the non-neutralizing antibodies can't bind to the functional spike. So then we just use negative selection, actually using one of these non-neutralizing antibodies to get rid of the bad uh, disordered trimers. So you have a mixture here just shown schematically, we envision a well-ordered trimer looks like this, as I'll show you the real EM of that. And that's on the next slide, so I don't know how well you can see this, but before um, selection with the antibody column, there's some well-ordered trimers, but a mess. They come out better. These are 2D reconstructions by negative stain EM done by Natalia de Valalda and in Andrew Ward's lab at Scripps. They have a lot of very fancy high uh, powered EM expertise. And then with using a computer, you can actually create, recreate, or three dimensions using these different 2D um, densities, because they go down in different ways on the EM grid. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. It's much faster than crystallography, which, you know, we've moved to this a lot. All, it, it's just not as high resolution most of the time. This is about 19 or 18 angstroms. So this is what we mean by a well-ordered trimer. There's these three lobes seen from the top. This is it from the side. This is the bottom. So this is sort of the twist of GP41 that holds everything together. These are from a JRFL strain. So from there, you get mixed trimers. But then when we purify and we do binding studies, this is shown as octet. It's a interferometry. It's white light based, but it's simpler to, similar to surface plasma residence, and basically you just get a nice signal. These are all broadly neutralizing antibodies. These are the quaternary ones, and these are non-neutralizing antibodies. So we use this antigenic profile. This always correlates with well-ordered, uh, well-packed trimers, because you're excluding these non-neutralizing epitopes over here from accessibility. There's a, another strain that we found um, somewhat fortuitously, where right off the size exclusion column, you can get nice thermal melting curves, and this forms trimers spontaneously off the size exclusion column, which is a good thing. We don't need any antibody selection uh, columns, which are not really scalable um, for, for any kind of mass production. There's a little aggregate here, but it's pretty much trimer um, right off of the uh, size exclusion column. And again, we have 3D reconstructions, and as I said, there is some high-resolution crystal in, in our our, we fit that into our trimer. So ours are very similar to what's been published. This was just, we do the same thing with this other design, SOSIP, just to say that we have clade B and clade C candidates, which are in um, immunogenicity studies in small animals, humanized mice that we're doing with Regeneron or non-human primates. And I'm just going to show you the data quickly from um, a recent 
study we've done, and in, uh, in, this is just done in guinea pigs. But JRFL, you'll have to take my word for it, is a pretty difficult strain to neutralize. So um, with these JRFL SOSIP trimers, we get um, homologous neutralization. So there's not a lot of breadth here. We, we are screening more viruses, but this is really what we're going for, being able to neutralize these more difficult um, viruses. This was an old trimer design. As you see, we don't get anything against um, JRFL, which is, as I said, a pretty difficult virus to neutralize. Um, there has been similar data reported with uh, other strains by other groups where they also get homologous neutralization against, we call these tier two viruses, but basically they're representative of circulating isolates. I just want to show you some other um, examples of games we're playing now uh, to make more soluble spikes. The idea is to present this spike because it still falls apart to the immune system essentially forever and again only presenting the the broadly neutralizing determinants, uh, logically, we'd hope to get those back. Um, I mean, but it probably isn't that simple. Uh, but, but anyway, we, as I said, the BG505 trimers form these well-ordered trimers um, much more readily than other strains. So we stared at the structure and picked out residues um, that were common between some of the other strains. And again, on this precipitation, uh, curve you can show we get recognized by all the broadly neutralizing antibodies, but now the non-broadly neutralizing antibodies don't recognize the trimer in the supernatant. So this is very early, but it looks like we can make well-ordered trimers of many envelopes. And the idea there is to recapitulate, say, lineages in patients that develop breadth. They are relatively rare. Or use cross-clade combinations to cover more um, genetic distance. So that's preliminary. And I'll just close with this image in which these were our old trimers arrayed on liposomes. So of course, um, a popular idea is to try to put these as a particulate display. And you can, hope you can see these well-ordered trimers, which look at these little triangles, array very nicely on these um, liposomes. So we're, we're quite interested in these as immunogens. We haven't even put these um, into animals yet. Um, this, is, this is pretty recent. And, uh, we are trying other particles, protonaceous particles, but the liposomes, which was described, for example, the RNA, uh, self-replicating RNA, they don't have anything, there's no other protein in there, so I think it's a, a nice thing. It's completely synthetic, except for the, the protein that you put on here. We, we capture these, actually, with a nickel lipid and a his tag, but you can do it by cysteine chemistry. And we have been talking to Vedantra, I think there was a talk here, from Vedantra that make uh, multi-layer liposomes that are more stable. So again, we're very preclinical here, although we are going into small animals with these um, shortly. So future directions of uh, these well-ordered trimers, which I hope at least I've given you a glimpse of what we're trying to do to develop a, uh, a, a, a soluble spike that will elicit uh, better antibodies than we normally get. Um, they're well-ordered, they're uncleaved, so I don't know if I made that clear. Normally, the spike has to get cleaved by furans to free the signal peptide. Um, but here, with this covalent linkage, we allow them to fall into this covalent, uh, uh, well-ordered state. So we don't require any furan. They simply, simply, simply assume the native state um, as a one covalent transcribed protein, transcribed translated protein. Um, no antibody columns. And you know they're more classical. Uh, we can use more scalable means of purification, which I hope will help for scale up as we go become much uh, more clinical. And we need other clades. Uh, we're, we're, we'd like, of course, a clade C envelope, which was on that first slide. Uh, most of the infections in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa, and most of those are clade C. So we'd like a whole uh, battery of clade C soluble trimers, and that's what we're working on. Um, we are working in uh, humanized mice with Regeneron, and, and we have a lot of antibodies isolated that they are, we're testing right now to see if we've elicited better broadly neutralizing antibodies by vaccination. Okay, and I'll finish there. The main people in my lab that did this uh, work were Shalindra Kumar, Kumar uh, Javier Guanaga, and Karen Tran, and Gymnasia just recently did the liposomes, but she also more recently had a baby last week. so. That project will sit there for three months until she comes back. Okay, um, and these are all the funders. Okay, thanks. Any questions? questions?
Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, so we've, we've done um, DSC, which is thermal melting. Uh, the, they vary from 57 up to 68 degrees, so they're relatively stable. And I didn't show you data, but we, yeah, we're doing 30, 30, 4 degrees and 37, of course, which are more relevant. And it does, there does seem to be an association. Actually, Ian Wilson and, and uh, Andrew, who are more structural biophysical, kept saying we need to do DSC, and where they will, what difference does it make if it's stable at 68 degrees? But it does seem to impart better stability at 37 in buffer or in adjuvant. We've looked at a few adjuvants, like Isco, Isco matrix, not so stable in uh, another one. I guess I might not say that one. Uh, since we have an agreement with them. And uh, yeah, that, we're doing things like that. And in terms of kinetics, about the BG505, this one strain at seven days, most of it will retain um, stability. At, uh, you, it starts to open up and you start seeing binding by some of the non-neutralizing antibodies, and for example, in the JRFL prototype. Certain envelopes, for reasons we don't completely understand, are not as stable as others. Um, we would like to do by structure based again is build in internal cysteines to make it more stable or, or other cross links. They do exist, the existing double bonds between the 140 and the 41 part, 120 and the 41 part. Well, that's in the SOSIP design, but even those have similar problems of, of, yeah, of opening it's up. <clears throat> so, in, yeah, we would like to link GP120 to 41 by other, artif other artificial <laughs> bonds. And now with the high resolution structure, there's actually one coming out on. Nature on October 8th that shows more of GP41. No, it's from Peter Kwong and uh, Marie Pensera at uh, NIH. So that will, we actually want to see it. I mean, I've collaborated with them in the past, but no coordinates yet. So they've had a head start on, you know, a more sophisticated design or at least more information uh, on design. Uh, so we're all eagerly awaiting that. The, the, this, the competing labs that are all doing this same approach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is really lab grade. Um, cell line would probably be more likely way, although there is efforts to make transient uh, more FDA acceptable. Um, yeah. So, but, but we get anywhere from um, if with a negative selection, you do have to, you know, you're discarding 90% of your protein by the time you cut the trimer peak and do negative selection. So there it's one to two MIGs, but for some of those that are more spontaneous, like BG505, that one clade A envelope, subtype A, that will get three or four MIGs per liter from a transient, and we haven't really pushed it. Uh, but the idea would be to, yeah, to, to either get transient, for small clinical trials, which a lot of people think are needed for HIV, to get small, at least immunogenicity in the humans, the turnaround time to make a cell line is like it's two years and you know three to five million dollars. So it's very limiting in terms of what you can test if you want to do human, what's been called you know small clinical trials, stock trials people have called them, which is really um, probably needed because we don't have great animal models. Uh, you know the humanized mice are very interesting human human immunoglobulin mice, but different, you know, slightly different repertoire due to selection on mouse proteins and it's, T it's mouse CD4 cells. So, you know, it's not completely validated as a predictive model. And then the challenge models are, are flawed. SHIV, um, you know, it's, it's basically SIV guts with an HIV envelope, but very few of them recapitulate natural disease course. And, uh, you know, then there's questions on the challenge that's considered most relevant is low dose repeated mucosal, you know, either vaginal or rectal. But the way you structure the experiment, you infect all animals within a few weeks, and is that too high of a bar compared to HIV, which often takes 200 to 800 exposures based upon epidemiology, at least, to, to, to transmit infection. What, how it gets transmitted is not clear. Is it one virus that uh, you know, gets through every 800 times, or is it, you know, when there's another a herpes 2 lesion, a big bolus goes through, and that's why it's, you know, there, there's these low numbers. It's not a very stable virus uh, outside of tissue culture, you know, outside of fluids. So, 
uh, yeah, it's, it's fortunately not that infectious uh, compared to some other more stable viruses. Uh, yes? No, it's just uh, stop codon uh, before the transmembrane and, and this flexible linker. And there's one other change in GP41, this, which is uh, keeps the, it's normally the GP41 likes to fold into a six helix bundle. Uh, a lot of envelope viruses use that to, to fuse virus to cell membranes, but that, prevent, that mutation prevents that. Uh, what else? You mean uh, fold on? Um, yeah, we've tried that and we're looking at other motifs. Now that we have a better structure, you should be able to fit some heterologous motif at the bottom to make it more stable. But you are entering, you are bringing then other epitopes into the mix, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, only immunogenicity testing will tell. Yeah, the pictures you showed of the glycosidic side chains wandering over the protein surface as if they were in charge of it uh, were, were very impressive. Um, the, the materials that you're going to use as a vaccine, will they be glycosylated? Probably. I mean, there were, there was old efforts. We actually are thinking of doing that, of, you know, doing full deglycosylation, but the, the protein then becomes actually much more susceptible, susceptible to proteolysis. So the glycans are there. I mean, they're host glycans. So that's, you know, I think a difficult vaccine target because we're not, we're tolerized to most of those things. Um, the, the hope is maybe in some clusters, you might be able to make an antibody response. But as, as you likely know, a lot of uh, uh, sugar antibodies are IgM and take use avidity to, uh, to actually bind. And yeah, so we would, but we would probably use a glyco. Uh, a glycosylated trimer. I think it's worth testing if a deglycosylated one might do better because there is this unusual feature of a lot of the viral envelope uh, glycoproteins is they have this sawtooth pattern where you boost and you wane quite rapidly. The antibody response and is it somehow, do the, do the end link glycans affect that? I don't think that's clear. I mean it happens to a certain extent with any um, vaccine or immunogen, but the wane time seems to be remarkably fast with at least HIV and, and, and even flu, uh, HA, wanes pretty fast. Uh, am I right in thinking the V3 loop was the highly variable loop in, in, in this uh, thing? Well, actually, it, V3 is a bit of a misnomer. It, it's variable, but it's not, the most variable are um, V1 and V2, which I can kind of actually form this kind of cap up top here. V3 is actually part of the co-receptor binding element, so it's conserved at the tip. There's this GPGR or GPGQ sequence that binds to the co-receptor. So that, the co-receptor is invariant, so you have to have parts that are invariant of V3. And uh, so it's, it's a little bit that's exposed on the surface is variable, but really it's not much of a, a target in a well-ordered spike. What happens though is there's a lot of 120 floating around or it binds to CD4 and then the V3 pops out. So you make a lot of antibodies to it, but since everybody makes antibodies, the virus is really selected against that. So that was a problem back in the 90s that we learned that we were actually doing neutralization assays on viruses that don't circulate in patients. You grow them in the lab and they open up and expose V3 because they replicate faster, but they're not representative of what's getting transmitted in the human population. Okay, let, let me be the devil's advocate sure. for something completely different. That's <laughs> all right. <laughs> You're looking now at a soluble um, material that floats around uh, outside the cells and eventually. Um, HIV, though, is not really a virus that likes to be outside the cells. It likes to be inside the cells. And what's more, when it's inside the cells, it integrates or its yeah, DNA sure. integrates with the cell nucleus DNA, okay? Now, um, I think I gave a talk about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to the members of the Italian Air Force, believe it or not, who invited me to give a talk on this. And I, 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 thinking about it, I said, you've got to set a thief to catch a thief. 
Uh, and what I meant by that was that if you actually had a, uh, a, a genome which was the same as the HIV ge genome, but H necessarily gave rise to a negative RNA as opposed to the positive RNA that's, that's normally coded for by the HIV genome when it gets integrated, then when the HIV genome in, in, gets replicated, then this other gene, which is also there, which has exactly the same control sequences as the regular virus, but when it makes proteins or other control elements, it produces negative RNA as opposed to positive RNA, which basically wipes out the replication process of the virus. Now, why aren't we... I think we are doing things like yeah, that, but yeah. isn't that a, another approach that we should be adopting? Well, the problem is, is you know, as soon as, you're, uh, as soon as someone is infected with HIV, it, I think we now know it, it seeds very rapidly all over the place, especially in these compart late, what are called latent compartments, which we don't fully understand. So you'd have to get your antisense, I mean, antisense has been tried, or sRNA, or microRNA, from, even from lentiviral vectors. Um, they, you know, the problem is, is they integrate, so that's, you know, that's a safety issue. Um, but you'd have to get that, your antisense, if, if that's how you're going to inhibit yeah. it, into every cell in vivo, the same cells that HIV has gone into, exactly. or have it in there in advance, I don't think anybody's going to put in a, you know, a, a, an integrating virus as a, as a prophylactic vaccine. Um, Why not? So just because it's associated with, you know, integration, mutagenesis. But, uh, but it happens like all that. the time. I mean, half the viruses that we use for vaccines get yeah, integrated one way or another. Yeah, I think it... Measles is in there in virtually every cell. Right, but... It, not integrated, but I guess... Not integrated, uh, no, but the papilloma viruses are, aren't they? Don't they get integrated? Mm, no, no, they don't, get, they don't integrate into the DNA. Uh, huh. EBV stays epiphytomal. Most things don't, you know, the retroviruses are the only Herpes ones virus that, doesn't? No, that's, no. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think, you see, I think that... Um, but, but your the, ideas such as that have been tried, and there's been efforts now that... Um, you know, there's, there's F, for 20 years ago, they were trying to do it. David Baltimore proposed this and others where you would take, say, T cells out, CD4s, which are the major target, tra okay. in, transfuse them in ex vivo with an antibody on the surface. People are going back to trying things like that now and then reinfuse and repopulate. Carl June has done this for cancer uh, with killer cells, but, you know, it. it it, it, it's possible those things are still on the drawing board to make to basically re, re genome you know the genome and then make a person resistant yeah there's also companies trying to not clip out CCR5 for example because there are CCR5 double knockouts so that's the co-receptor in, in the developed world at least there's no there's very limited consequence of that although you are susceptible to West Nile believe, believe it or not very yeah because, uh, well, Tim Fouts is back. There's a guy in the field, James Hoxie. He happens to be, he's a uh, well-known HIV researcher, and he's a CCR5 double negative, so people are always asking him for his PPMCs. Uh, but, so, and he's doing well, at last I saw him at least. So, I mean, you don't really, you don't really need CCR5. And there is the Berlin patient where he was, he was actually a transfused with a CCR5 double knockout in, after bone marrow transplant, and... Uh, ablation, and he's resistant. He's the one case of HIV cure. There was another, this Mississippi baby, but unfortunately, uh, you know, as a young girl, she's now but we've always re got the, re replicating the, virus. The, the, the prostitutes who basically take any amount of this thing and sort of survive it in the end. They're also survivors of <laughs> well, one sort or yeah. another. I mean, there are, there, as you can appreciate, there's, there are different windows of risk or levels of risk you could take depending on your, your, your life style but I, risk. But my feeling is, is yeah. that we're being unnecessarily held down by the regulatory agencies and fear of what they may say or what they may do, I think that we, we basically have to break through this because we're becoming a, a, almost a pusillanimous and cowardly society uh, in the face of these arbitrary individuals who basically ask for everything and give nothing. And, and they don't really do anything at the end of the day 
um, uh, the, the, that's of major significance. I mean, all they're really doing with all this regulation is changing the level of confidence you have in how safe or immunogenic a thing might be, but you knew that anyway. They're just changing your level of confidence. I'm a little bit more confident. So what? I mean, uh, yeah. when we've got major diseases out there that really need to be tackled, we should basically accept more risk, much more risk than we're accepting at the moment. And I think that the, the agencies have to be challenged and use whatever means, uh, and you as a researcher and people in the companies have to use whatever means is available to challenge the, um, the, the, the stranglehold that the agencies have uh, in terms of being able to get novel products into the marketplace, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I think there in the, certainly within the HIV field, there has a, a, been a growing movement to get into humans, at yeah. least with phase one trials, which gives you some information on safety, of course, but sure. you can at least have a test in vitro efficacy. You don't really get any real world challenge, you know, real world challenge out of there very often. But yep. Um, and of course, well, we were all aware of something like Ebola when there's, you know, there's safety, the safety bar is lowered when there's a, a need like that to, to try things that have not gone through full uh, re regulatory agency approval. So it, it can, I mean, they did AZT in exactly the same way. Right. I mean, that was just under pressure and, uh, and it turned out to be totally useless. But it didn't kill that many people either, so far right. as I know. Well, it's not useless when you have the other, uh, when you have no. a couple of other drugs, but it, uh, by itself, uh, yeah, it was, yeah. it didn't prolong the end point. It helped pregnant women, I believe, in producing less infected babies. Yeah. Well, it was good short term, but the virus would escape because it, yeah. rep, you know, it ha replicates and spins off all these mutants. So you need at least the two other drugs to other targets. And then, you know, now that we're in a place where drugs work very well for HIV. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Well, thank you very much. It was very okay. stimulating. And thank you all very much. And thank our speakers very much.